Thanks. Well, you pretty much gave, did gave my talk already. But uh, I'll see if I can add something about what we know about the past and how we can use that to learn something about the future also. But let's start close to home. Let's start where we are right now. This is what we would imagine that our galaxy, the Milky Way, would look like if we observed it from far away. Now, the Milky Way, our galaxy, contains about 100 billion stars. Of course, the Sun is one of them. And this entire system is kept together, is bound by gravity. The same force that keeps me grounded here is what keeps the system together. We know there are a lot of other galaxies out there. We can observe them. Many of them are heavier and contains more stars than the Milky Way. And one thing we've known now for almost 80 years is that most of the galaxies appear to move away from us. And the further away they are, the faster they appear to move away from us. Now that means that the universe is expanding, it's growing. But it also means that if we go back in time, it must have been smaller. And if we go back really far, it must have started really small. And this discovery is one of the cornerstones of our current understanding of the universe. It was born a long time ago in some kind of Big Bang. As she grew older, she also expanded in size and finally became the mature grand lady that we observe today. Now this also raises an important question. What will happen to the universe in the future? Will it continue to expand forever? We have all these galaxies, all this matter, and the galaxies pull each other through gravity. So for a long time, the question was, is the universe heavy enough to stop the expansion? Well, we can't look into the future, so we can't really answer that question that way, but we can actually look into the past. All of you came here today because you wanted to watch this event live. At least you might think you're watching it live. It actually takes 0.1 microseconds for the image of me to reach your eyes. Give or take, those of you in the front row get to see me a little bit earlier. You were probably here earlier. Um, so for everyday life, it doesn't matter at all. I mean, 0.1 microseconds is short enough to be considered now. But if we go out to space, this effect starts to matter. If you go to the planets, those are a few hours away. If you go to the nearby stars, they are a few years away. And the nearby galaxies are a few million years away. So looking at things that are far away gives us a method to look back in time and to look what the universe looked like millions of years ago. The problem is, how do we know how far away something is? Well, it's quite easy, actually. If you think of something, a light source, a light bulb or anything, it will appear fainter the further away it is. You can think about the headlights of a car, for instance. They will appear brighter as the car is approaching you. So if we find some kind of light source, we measure its brightness in a distant galaxy, and we compare it to the brightness in a nearby galaxy. Then we get an estimate of how far away it is, and if we know how far away it is, we also know the time difference, how far ago it happened. The other thing I told you was the further away an object is, the faster it appears to move away from us. But if it's far away, we're looking back in time. And at that point, the universe must have been smaller. So if we compare how, far, how fast an object in a distant galaxy appeared to move away from us compared to an uh, object in a nearby universe, we get an estimate of how much the universe has grown during that time. So if we measure two variables, distance, which is time, and this comparison, which is size, then we can estimate how the universe is growing with time. If a scientist measures two variables, what do they do? They put them in a diagram. <laughs> this is a diagram where the horizontal axis shows you the time, the first variable. The vertical axis shows you the size of the universe. The dotted lines show you where we are today. We can put 
theory and theories. We can put predictions and models of where we are, how we think the universe would have expanded from the Big Bang, which is at the bottom today. This is a very simple theory I just put up. This is what the universe would look like if it was completely empty, if there was nothing in there. Then we have the Big Bang. It started off, it started expanding, and it started expanding at a constant rate. So it's just a straight line. Now we know that the universe is not empty. We are here, there are galaxies, there are planets, there is a lot of matter in the universe. If we add matter to our model of the universe, it looks something like this. Uh, the curved lines are models where we add more and more matter to the universe. And the more matter we, we add, the further we push the lines to the right. You can also see how matter slows down the expansion um, by the curviness. So what happens if we measure these things instead? If we go out in the universe and actually observe it, then it looks like this. All the black points are actually observations. Now I said that the straight line was an empty universe. When you add matter to it, when you add stuff to it, you go to the right. These observations seem to prefer something that is on the other side. These observations seem to prefer something that is less than empty. How can something be less than empty? This observation seems to prefer some kind of anti-gravity. And that is very strange. If you fit some kind of theory to it, it looks like this. And if you look at this curve, it's not a straight line anymore, it actually goes up. This anti-gravity leads to the fact that the universe is accelerating. Now to, to a cosmologist, this is a very, very strange thing. This is like one day dropping your coffee cup, but instead of watching it fall, you see it actually being pushed away from the ground and accelerating into space. And you would be pretty surprised if that happened. The discovery I'm talking about that the universe is accelerating uh, was based on about 10% of, of the observations that I show here. And that was done in the late 1990s, and it was rewarded by the Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago. What have we have done since then is that we've actually observed this much better. So now we don't only know that the universe is, is accelerating, we can also say something about the properties of the acceleration. One thing I also would like to mention is that I show you nine black dots here. But included in these nine black dots are measurements on 500 galaxies. And it took 20 years for the global scientific or the global astronomical community to actually make those observations. So there's a number of students and a lot of endless sleepless nights that went into making that diagram. Okay, we can say something about the properties of the acceleration. That brings me to my final slide, our view of the universe today. At least this is the way I look at it. We're sitting somewhere in the universe, we're observing it, we're looking out through space, and the further away we observe, the further back in time we also observe. But there's a limit, there's a horizon. We cannot look further back than the universe actually has been existing. So there is an ultimate limit on how far back we can see. The universe is not empty. There are galaxies, there are planets, there are all these things here. So we have to add that to the universe. This is all the matter in the universe. And matter has this property that it actually clumps and clusters forms galaxies. This is the property of matter. Now, I told you something about the property of this accelerating force. What does it look like? We can measure it. And what we realized recently is that we appear to be swimming around in some kind of accelerating soup. It's everywhere. It's very weak, so we haven't seen it until now. We need to look at very, very large volumes in order to see the effects of it. What is this acceleration? Well, the simple answer to that is that we don't know. We don't really have a clue. We have theories and we have ideas, and you can all go home and Google them afterwards. But the point I'd like to make here is that if this is true, if this picture is correct, that it's evenly distributed in space, then that suggests that the accelerating thing, or whatever causes it, is tightly connected to space itself. Now, space is such a basic concept that is very difficult to grasp. But what this is suggesting is that 
there is an essential part of the most fundamental level of nature that we're not understanding. Hopefully future observations and deep thinkers can come up with ideas, and there are some ideas that suggest that perhaps we need to look outside the aquarium in order to understand what's going on in it. Thank you for listening.